And it's great to welcome you all here. My name is Jay Frost, and if you're new to this little party, this, of course, is the Philanthropy Mastermind Series brought to you by our friends at Donor Search. And today you can actually see the logo for the company there on the slide. Uh, that's just courtesy of our presenter who is connected to the company. Um, but both that fact and the fact that Donor Search has been underwriting this uh, are coincidental to the series itself. Uh, Donor Search has been underwriting a series of conversations with wonderful people in this field since 2016. And we're doing that again today with somebody whose work I admire, a wonderful guy. Who is also doing this after a night of the shakes so uh he's, <laughs> he's done this after a fever so bear with him as he still shares what is over a quarter century experience working in top shops in higher ed uh health care with um with uh, social services um you name it independent schools uh both in the shop running the operation as well as council um, before he arrived on the scene working with donor search um, so he'll be sharing from that broader experience, of course, as well as what he does today on board building for high impact engagement and explosive fundraising growth. I know you know that title already, and that's why you're here, but I want to make sure you heard it. Now, we do have a couple ways that you can interact with us today. And if you've heard this before, just put your fingers in your ears or get a glass of water. As I go through this drill, it's important. The first is the chat. Please do let our presenter, Mark Parker, know that you are here. If you would do that by going to the bottom of your page, typically there and just saying hello, I know he would appreciate that and I would as well. It's also a way for you to see one another. So please just go in there and you can raise your hand just as one person just did, but also just say hello. Just to tell us maybe where you're from, which organization you're with, which city you're in from. If you can say howdy, that was very nice. All those things are welcome. The chat's also a perfect place for you to talk with one another throughout this presentation. It's not necessarily the place where we'll be looking carefully for your questions, however. So if you would please use the Q&A for any questions or even comments that you'd like us to directly address at the conclusion of the presentation today. So please do use chat for you, Q&A, to make sure that Mark has a chance to address your questions. Um, now, of course, there are two questions that always come up, so I'm going to tell you the answers right now, and I'll probably tell you again later. The first is that, will you have access to the slides? In fact, let me ask Mark. Mark, will it be okay to share these slides with everybody after today? Oh, 100%. Okay, so there we go. So you'll have those slides. And secondly, there will be a recording of this made and placed over the donor search site. You won't hear us talking much about donor search today, I don't think, unless Mark chooses to mention the company for some reason, aside from our gratitude for their providing this platform. But at the donor search site, under the resources tab, you'll see lots and lots of recordings from this series, as well as a calendar of everything coming. A recording of this session will be placed there probably in the next few hours. So you can share it with your colleagues and friends. You'll also see an email coming to you with a link. So if you don't get that, uh, do let us know. You can always reach out to us directly through donor search, or you can reach out to me either on LinkedIn or at j at donorsearch.net with any comments, questions, or for a copy of any of this material. Now with that, I'm gonna make sure I pass the baton quickly to my friend and a friend to us in the field, Mark Parker. Mark, take it away. Jay, many, many thanks. And just to continue along the lines of housekeeping, um, I uh, the last thing I want to do here is to fall into the habit uh, that we've all seen too much of, experienced too much of, which is to have some slides read to you. I wanted to put some slides together for you, um, partly to have something in the way of a checklist um, uh, around my notions uh, on this topic. Um, also, it was kind of a guidepost for the conversations. Um, and I really want to emphasize the conversational part of this. Uh, Jay is a fantastic moderator, host. Um, I think of him as the Dick Cavett in this space, really. Um, so your questions, your thoughts, your observations along the way through the chat would be greatly encouraged and appreciated. Um, Jay, let me add um, our, my sense of gratitude to you uh, in the Mastermind series for what it's meant in the lift of the donor search brand. Um, more importantly, let me say how appreciative I am of the platform and how it's um, been a great stage for thought leadership in this really important space. Your programming is timely, it is rich, it is valuable. And I think we all uh, owe you gratitude for that. Um, which leads me to wonder, and please explain, what in the world am I doing here? <laughs> so um, 
but I am here and I do have a bit of a story to tell. And indeed, uh, having stepped on uh, plenty of rakes in the last 25 years, having worked with upwards of 20, 25 boards in various uh, capacities over the years as a consultant, as an in-house annual fund officer, major gift officer, chief development officer, I have seen and known some boards, and I can I can tell you that the number of boards that kind of fit the the, the goal, uh, the aspirational board that uh, we're going to talk about here today, uh, of those 20, 25 organizations I've worked with, probably on two or three fingers, I can count the ones that I felt like were really, really getting it done when we're thinking about high impact engagement and the fundraising growth that that can generate. So um, super excited for the opportunity, Jay uh, and friends to have this conversation with you. I am feeling a little bit dodgy. Uh, we've had a dreary, dreary, cold, cold, wet, long winter here in Portland, Oregon. And I think it's catching up with my upper respiratory system a little bit. So I'm gonna power through and I'm gonna uh, thank you for, for sticking with us through this. Um, my story, real in, in a nutshell, um, was a pretty unsuccessful English teacher in a boarding school in Virginia back in 1992. And little did I know what an incredible opportunity was in front of me when I was invited to be the school's first fully dedicated annual giving officer. I had a great mentor who was new to the school. Um, I got great fundamental grounding, and I think in all aspects of fundraising. Um, was able to attend the Case Summer Institute back when we had those things down at Williamsburg, uh, uh, specifically for the independent school space. Uh, some really fantastic thought leadership uh, led that program. David Pond was at Deerfield at the time. Helen Colson, who was at Sidwell Friends, uh, who really who wrote the book on independent school fundraising. Um, uh, were the were the chief faculty there? Came back to Tappahannock, Virginia, to launch my first campaign. We initiated uh, in our goals for the year um, an aspiration to to reach fifty percent alumni giving. Uh, we did that, and that in that in itself became one of the real seminal learning things in a twenty five year career. We we did achieve fifty two percent alumni giving and sustained it over a couple of years. And we actually raised less money. <laughs> so that was pretty darn counterintuitive. And I think that kind of hardened in my own mind a real emphasis on the importance of high value kind of major gift conversations, whether it was a major gift for an annual fund, whether it was a major gift for a capital, came, capital campaign, whether it was a principal gift, an endowment gift, a brick and mortar gift, whatever it might be. Um, I've always looked to build a fundraising plan and set priorities around um, not so much more gifts, but more substantial gifts, more transformational gifts. And I think if I read the landscape properly, uh, where we are today, um, I think we're all probably experiencing a lot of competition for dollars. It seems like the fundraising pie um, not a whole lot different from where it was in 1992, 93, 94, when I was cutting my teeth. I guess what, Jay, uh, something between two and three percent of GDP um, annually uh, flows to nonprofit causes. That hasn't changed a whole lot over the years. Uh, certainly, we talked a lot about the 80 20 rule back then. More and more, we're talking about the 90 10. Uh, the 95-5 rule where we're seeing more and more big gifts drive fundraising results. Um, so for me, it's like, you know, everything's changed and nothing has changed. Back then we talked about a typical tenure for a development officer to be 18 to 24 months. I think we're not seeing that change. There was a lot of talk of too much turnover in organizations at the staff level, at the leadership level. I certainly see that every day in the clients that I work with here at Donor Search. A lot of instability. Everyone wants more deeper, long standing, high functioning relationships. So uh, today I want to talk about what I think that looks like, kind of in my terms. Um, and I guess I would just kick off and talk about what I might call the trustee trifecta. What are we really looking for 
Um, and again, there's chapter and verse libraries full of information that's available to you. Board Source is a great resource. There's so many books, so many to do guides, how to do, you know, to do guides on building boards, managing boards. Um, pretty universal um, consensus about what that looks like. For me, if I have to boil it all down, I'm looking for mission alignment. I'm looking for a CEO, a staff, trustees, marketing uh, to be in close, close alignment as to what this organization exists to do. Is it a school? Is it a hospital? Is it a food bank? Um, what is that mission? Do we all have a common understanding and a shared voice as to how we would articulate that purpose, that theory of change? Do I think that creative tension is important? Absolutely. Um, I think that a valuable board is going to be one that is going to ask questions, um, that is going to have some difficult conversations from time to time. And I think it's best when those things are related to maybe strategy, uh, maybe tactics, um, but certainly not the definition of what the organization exists to do. Um, the reverse, the flip side of that, I think is something we see too much of and that's mission creep. Um, so that I think is something to, to watch for. That is something I think that your a, a healthy governing board is going to inoculate the organization against. Uh, we're looking for a board that has, yes, absolutely, um, deep diversity, broad diversity. And that I'm thinking about experience, perspective, I'm thinking about linkage. A board needs to have skill sets. You need people from accounting, you need people from HR, you need people from finance, you need people from the law profession. Their perspective, their skill sets are gonna be super valuable in helping that organization, helping that board carry out its fiduciary function, right? And I think we all know that a board is there to raise money for us, to help us make connections to foundations, to benefactors, to stakeholders like themselves who can grow and sustain mission, right? And then I think there's this very subtle thing that sometimes gets pretty complicated, what I would call role alignment. Um, is this trustee here for the right reasons? We're gonna talk a lot about that. Um, and does that trustee stay in the proper lane? A lot of my experience was in independent schools over the years. And I can't tell you how common it was for parents, which are gonna always make up um, a lot of those board seats in an independent school setting, um, to maintain a healthy separation between their interest as parents and their institutional interest as a trustee. That's, I think, a kind of a basic uh, example of where that role can get murky and can get complicated. So having a CEO, having a committee on trustees, having a board chair who is watchful and attentive to those kinds of things and can make sure that that board understands that our role is strategic, it is high level, it is not about managing the organization that certainly is going to accrue to the benefit of that board and the organization. I think it's important when we're thinking about board board members, and Jay and I were actually touching on this a little bit just prior to the call now, is who makes up a board and what do we want those board members to look like? What are the attributes that we're looking for? What are the things that bring people to the table? And I would suggest that this is a pretty good list of what's going on in the heart and minds of those people sitting around your board table. Um, certainly you're looking for people that express and live a passion for the cause. They care. They wanna sustain this mission. They wanna grow this mission. Maybe they're there because they see something wrong. Um, uh, too many hungry people, um, not enough access to healthcare, um, not enough not enough women uh, achieving leadership positions in science and technology. All, all those things can be baked into that mission statement, that, that driving cause for a given organization. They wanna be part of that. They wanna be part of a solution. Um, maybe they are longstanding stakeholders, alumni. Maybe they're grateful patients. They've got some kind of longstanding connection to that organization itself. 
quite commonly, boards are populated by people with one degree of separation with the people on the board who preceded them. Um, that also is true enough and very commonplace. Plenty of organizations, plenty of professions, investment banking, um, uh, law firms, accounting firms will look to their leadership to take and maintain active roles in the nonprofit community in which they do business. Um, that is a factor, of course. Um, and people quite feel, you know, feel naturally like it, it looks good. It feels good. It just feels like where I need to be at a certain stage of my life is working to benefit, to support nonprofit causes in my community. Okay. So any individual might have a mix of some or all of these things at work. I think it's also fair to say that, you know, when you boil it down, your trustees are coming to the table uh, and they're falling along some spectrum, just like donor motivations that lie somewhere between self-interest and pure altruism, okay? Um, so I think as you're thinking about a board, as you're working with your leadership to identify, cultivate, map out what the ideal board um, uh, population is gonna look like for your organization, you know, think about these things. What's gonna drive people, as you're looking at your current board, I think understanding where they might fall on this spectrum. Are they in a healthy place by and large or not? I mean, for sure, um, I, have, I have seen um, board members over the years who were from the building and trades who maybe wanted to get up, you know, uh, at the head of the line when there was a capital project. Um, people from financial sectors who had a real interest in managing that institutional endowment. Those things are not necessarily bad, um, but again, your organization needs to want to be mindful of that, want to keep those things in check, so that ultimately we can kind of get to and score uh, effectively these core expectations. Um, just so you know, I'm not kind of making this stuff up. I, I went to Board Source. Um, I borrowed this list from them. This is what they define as a set of core expectations for your board. I kind of put it in checklist form because I'm going to submit to you that you might want to look at each of your board members, um, present, hopefully future, and ask, you know, how, you know, how you're scoring on these things. Uh, these are the core roles of a governing board at the bottom. Um, I think is the uppermost, which is to ensure adequate financial resources for the sustainability, for the growth of that organization. They're there to give and to get. Now, a lot of this conversation is gonna be around the more subtle art of how you inject those kind of expectations into your board. I, I know Jay and I would agree that a great many boards are lacking this. Again, as I noted uh, earlier on in the call, in my experience, there were, you know, the vast majority of boards I had the pleasure of working with had some appreciable deficits in one or more areas here. All too common, it had to do with fundraising. Um, it's not uncommon for that board member to expect that highly compensated, I say that in quotation marks, development office to be out there um, raising money. Um, they're looking to, they're happy to give you the name of a foundation in town that they think um, could come, uh, to, to, could, could be a factor. Um, oftentimes they're just not looking uh, to see and to, and to express what their role should be, can be, I think ought to be uh, in, in, in raising money. Um, so, um, when I was putting this together, I was, I was thinking about the, I guess it's a quote from uh, Tolstoy uh, about uh, happy families. I think the line goes, uh, you know, all happy families are alike, uh, but all unhappy families are unhappy in their own way. Um, I'm thinking about all the boards that seem to be high performing. Um, and I think really the, the gold standard here, the uppermost uh, attribute we could ascribe to those high functioning boards would be this. I mean, this is where we're looking to be at the end of the day, uh, building a board that's gonna engage relentlessly 
and they're going to bring passion and purpose to this. I have a theory, we're going to go into the underpinnings of that, that your board, your staff, your CEO are going to really be on a on a really sustainable, successful, happy, productive plane when we're able to build some scaffolding around expectations, uh, the how-tos, the priorities, and you know, have those challenging, difficult, kind of growth-centric conversations that move people there. But I think it's true, and I've seen it all too often, there will be some people maybe on your board now, hopefully you're gonna grow that population, make it more of the norm, who just love helping the organization, who feel great about helping the organization, who feel like it fulfills some very deep purpose on that Maslow hierarchy of human needs. Um, you know, making a difference in the world is a, you know, is a key driver for that kind of universe. Um, of people that you really, really want to identify and groom. And you're going to have to provide them a lot of help to get there. Uh, in most cases, very few board members are going to, going to come to the table already arrived at that place. So I think it's a great gift. I think it's that thing we talk about when we talk about culture of philanthropy. Um, that thing that I think we're all aspiring to one way or another is to have people who just are loving what they're doing and are super excited about helping the organization grow. And they're excited to tell their friends, invite their friends, engage with their friends, their peers, um, the financial stakeholders in your community. Um, uh, worked for a great chief executive uh, who loved to uh, frame aspirations, goals around the end. What is it that we want to be true when we're looking back? Uh, what is the ultimate direction we're trying to, trying, to, uh, trying to achieve here, the end point that we're looking to arrive at? Um, so for me, I think I want, us, I, want your, I want a board member to be able to say, uh, in all confidence, I know what I'm doing. I know how to do it. I know why I'm doing it. And I feel excited about the difference that I'm making. For me, that is the kind of the aspirational touchstone for what the ideal trustee looks like and talks like. Now, when it comes to the what I'm doing and the how to do it, that I think is where some really important kind of scaffolding um, and development work needs to take place, kind of at the staff level and at the CEO level. Um, look at that here as we go forward. The why I'm doing it, um, they all have their reasons. They all may have this mix of motivations, see above. Um, but we, when we can get them understanding that and being able to articulate the why, uh, I think we move them closer to this level of, of, uh, of impact and that sense of gratification that can come through being a high impact board member. Um, so I think when it comes to the art of this, it's gonna be very hard for us if we're a chief development officer, um, uh, a CEO um, to have sufficient leverage to make a change, uh, to inflect the direction of a board uh, into what might be more like this standard of high engagement, high impact, okay? So how do you do that? Um, it won't happen overnight, depending on where your organization is. It might be a multi-year process. It might be, as I experienced a few years ago uh, as a chief development officer, it might be that something like a capital campaign can be the driver uh, can be the transformational process that can kind of um, create that shift, uh, that can create that change in culture. Um, and that's fine. Um, alternatively, you may be talking about bringing in a consultant, um, taking the board someplace out of their typical comfort zone to do some self reflection and some self study. And most cases, I think that might end up being uh, driven and led by a third party. That's 
perfectly fine because I think you need to bring to the table more than anything else some objectivity. Okay. And the reason I lead with this quote here, uh, Jay, do you know the other half of this quote if they get you asking the wrong questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> the other half of this, this is a Thomas Pynchon quote, right? I can't remember exactly what the context is, but it goes something like this. If they get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. And I think that's somewhat symptomatic, symbolic of what all too often is happening in the board dynamic. Um, we're here, we have a voice, we have agency in your organization. Let me tell you, or let me suggest how we ought to be doing this, okay? These trustees are in, you know, in all earnestness, bringing what they have to the table. Um, the flip side of that, um, so that the organization is not continually put in a reactive posture and trying to serve all the subjective idiosyncratic interest and whims of 15 board members, 20 board members, 30 board members, hopefully not, you don't have that many. Um, but if they're driving the agenda, if they're pushing the questions, then it's gonna be very, very difficult for the organization to um, put that trustee role in the right direction, okay? So again, I think a third party intervention, um, I think building the scaffolding that I've alluded to earlier um, becomes um, a really um, a, a compelling way, an effective way uh, to begin getting things pointed in the right direction. And this I think is, has to be uh, somewhere in the mix, uh, an organization that's doing real, honest, genuine, authentic, strategic planning. Okay, um, bring all your constituency to the table, hear their voices, hear their story about the organization, their relationship with it, be candid and open and honest with them about where the organization's going, what its financial health is, what its impact is relative to its mission, and then create a way forward, make it time bound, make it specific, put dollars and cents to those objectives that are in your strategic plan. I can't tell you how many strategic plans I've seen that were a series of aspirational bullet points it had very little underpinning, um, very little specificity around how we would get there, what it would cost, and ultimately what it would deliver for the organization or the people, the communities that it's serving, okay? All that I think has to be baked into that strategic plan and the process around building that strategic plan. Powerful, powerful, essential way to get that board member, those board members engaged with the right questions, right? Pretty basic stuff. Um, does your board have a performance dashboard? Are you continually keeping them apprised of the organizational's impact, where the budget stands, what the cost of fundraising is, is it growing year over year? Does it include some mix of new donors, recurring donors, even lost donors? What's the trend line there around fundraising? Again, that's obviously gonna be essential to the viability of the organization. Objectivity uh, can come through an important degree through benchmarking. Um, where does this organization stand relative to organizations in the community when it comes to impact, when it comes to dollars raised? Where does it stand nationally in its cohort in terms of all those, um, all those outcomes, all those drivers? Um, Gathering that information, sharing that information, getting your board to wrestle with it, again, I think is getting them thinking about the right questions, okay? And then, again, going back to board source, et cetera, et cetera, what, is, what are the industry standards? What are the, what are the commonly held best practices for how a board functions and what's expected of it? And here's where I think things get really, really hard for boards whether it's the committee on trustees, whether it's the CEO of the organization, laying out an explicit detail, what you want from someone 
and when you want it, what the work is, how you want them to go about doing it, how their success will be measured in doing it. It's really tough uh, to sell. It's not hard to spell out on paper, which you absolutely should, but making that shift to where we're moving from please come and sit on this board. We're going to meet four times a year or we're going to meet every month. And you may find yourself sitting here just listening to a series of presentations that are done from, you know, internal leaders, managers within the organization and giving it your stamp of approval. Um, we want to move beyond that. Okay. That's not good enough. Right. Oh, and then I guess you got to throw in there when we're talking about objectivity, screen and rank your prospect pool. Have you done it in three years? Have you done it in five years? Hopefully, you're not, you know, you're not going between five years, more than five years um, between screening and analyzing objectively um, what your potential is, what the financial potential is um, in your inside your organization. Okay, so screening is imperfect. There are multiple vendors in this space. To me, the ultimate importance of that screening and ranking is that it provides CEO, board members, staff, some frame of reference, some agreed upon sense of what the realistic fundraising lift is for that organization. We can quibble about the details, but at the end of the day, we hopefully would all agree this is what we need to be scoring ourselves against in terms of what we should be raising, what we're not raising, okay? So again, I think not trying to leverage change through the force of personality um, or any other kind of subtle, subtle leverage, but really just saying, let's talk about a framework. Where's the organization now? Where does it want to go? How do we spell that out? Um, how are we doing week to week, month to month, year to year? How are we doing relative to what other boards look like? Um, all those things I think are, un, are, are, are unpersonalized, if that's the word. Um, they're objective. Uh, they're accepted standards for what a high performing board looks like. Um, that uh, is what I mean by getting the right questions in the mix. And then kind of shifting to the thought around how to get the board engaged uh, in a high value way, in a highly engaged way in the work of fundraising, I think is kind of where we turn now. Um, be realistic with yourselves. I, I have always found that principle of thirds to be, you know, to prevail. Um, you know, if I've got 15 people on a volunteer committee or 15 people on a board, you know, I think realistically five, six people um, doing the lift, being really, really focused and reliable and engaged um, is, um, is, is doing pretty well. It's doing pretty well. Hopefully there would be a middle group that might catch the bug <laughs> and come on over to your side. And I think the other part of the reality is here, as you're setting these explicit expectations, um, as you're changing the culture, as you're resetting the norm of what it is to be on this board, um, expect some attrition. Um, it's perfectly natural once people are told or explained what their expectations are gonna be for them to make a reasonable choice that this is not the thing for me. And I think we're doing them a tremendous disservice. We're doing our organizations a tremendous disservice when we don't have the backbone, if you will, to say, this really is what we need. This really is what we're looking for. Maybe this is you. Maybe it's not, and that's fine. So given where your board stands today, what may be a healthy byproduct of where I'm going here is that you're providing people a very dignified off-ramp, okay? Ideally, you would fill that seat with someone who better fits this mold. Fair enough? Jay, any thoughts there? Gonna kind of catch my breath here. 
<laughs> Didn't mean to leave you hanging there, Mark. <laughs> no, no, I'm enjoying this. I did, uh, I did note a couple of uh, notes earlier, though, in the chat. I just want and the questions. Um, may I go ahead and share those with you now? Oh, would you please? Yes, thanks, Jim. Um, one was from uh, Nancy, who had said earlier in the chat that uh, she suggests benchmarking against peers who we are like and aspirants. Who do we want to be like? Which I thought was kind of an interesting observation about different types of board members and what they could bring to us. Um, any thoughts on that? Uh, spot on, spot on. And, and um, thanks for kind of reinforcing that point. I, 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 do, I do think benchmarking is, is, is critically important. And depending on what sector you're in, you probably can avail yourself of some really, really quality really, really granular kinds of benchmarking. And they have to do with staff salaries, staff sizes, you know, dollars raised, um, board profiles. Um, um, you know, there's probably a diminishing return for what benchmarking you're introducing uh, into your board conversations. I think a lot of this work uh, should be happening with a committee on trustees. Hopefully your board matrix includes a committee on trustees. Um, they should be charged with the recruiting and vetting um, and assessment of their peers on, on a given board. But yes, absolutely, Nancy. Um, um, comparing yourself to other like organizations, um, I think is critical. Obviously, um, you know, a food bank performs very differently, has different impacts, different budget, different staffing than a private school right so yeah the, the the sector matters and i think i think the local landscape matters too um i did a lot of work in in sacramento over the years um very very different ph philanthropic landscape in sacramento than san francisco portland is a very different philanthropic landscape than seattle so i think one would would have to temper if one's looking at a, port, a Portland based independent school versus one in Seattle, I think you kind of have to temper expectations, given the reality that there's just there's a lot of money in Seattle and there's there's less money, I think, um, flowing into philanthropy in Portland, per se. So I think you have to kind of like real estate values, you have to kind of you have to kind of qualify those those benchmarks a bit. Um, fair enough. Other questions? Oh, yes. And and we have another one that, that I think does relate to that and, and something maybe I would have asked you later, which has to do with the evolutionary uh, positioning of the organization. Sometimes it's about the size of the board. Sometimes it's about, you know, where they are in their trajectory, be, the, going from, let's say, a working board, if you will, to one that's more strategic. And Leslie had asked earlier in the Q&A, um, uh, she'd said uh, rather, uh, we're a small board and grateful to be coming out of a pandemic solvent. Yeah, so congratulations on that, Leslie. Right. I'd like some advice recruiting high-performing trustees as at least around here, it's become harder than normal getting folks to engage and perform. And I know that's much of what you're talking about here, but what I uh, zeroed in on her in her comment, uh, Mark, is, is this idea about a small board and, and getting those kinds of high performing people, especially if your benchmark, maybe your aspirational bedmark, benchmark is, uh, is an organization across town, across county, across the state that is larger and maybe um, has been around longer. So uh, yeah. are you going to get into a little bit more of that later, or would you like to try and take that on now? No, let me, let me touch on that now, uh, assuming I'm fully grasping the implications there. I, I think a small board can, can outperform a bigger board. Um, I would put it somewhat crudely and say a smaller board, people have, <laughs> they have less, less places to hide. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, uh, and again, I mean, you, you look at what kind of results that can be leveraged by a board of five versus a board of 15, uh, even if you take into account that principle of thirds and you've kind of right-sized expectations, I mean, yeah, it's, there's, there, there could be magnitudes of difference, but I think it's, you know, we used to talk about this a lot in, in the education space. It's. It's uh, it's not where that where that student starts in their academic performance, but you know where they end, right? So, 
you know, I think if you're benchmarking yourself against that vastly more mature, sophisticated organization, that may be a bit of a disservice. I think you would have to be careful about saying what's the aspiration, what's the possibility here. But I think in the near term, it's like, you know, can we double um, our impact uh, fundraising wise um, between now and next year? You know, can we see a 20% sustained growth rate? And if that's true, then maybe for how many years would that be realistic? But I think less important than what you can project is your five-year fundraising outcomes. It's more, it's more immediate. It's like something as basic as, okay, if there's four of us on this committee, right? And collectively we've made zero <laughs> visits for cultivation purposes in the last month, then can you do, I mean, I, I, how I, I think, enjoyed a lot of success in managing volunteers was really right-sizing the project and maybe even spoon-feeding expectations to them, i.e., it would be great if you could call these three people this week, okay? It would be great if of those three people, we could get an appointment sometime in the next month and have a sit down with them, right? Those are really important inflection points. So again, um, take a you know, a realistic snapshot of where you are today um, and empower and coach and train and support that board to just start doing some of the right things and not oversetting expectations. It's kind of like what we read about all the time in January when we're, when we're all thinking about going on a diet, right? It's not being perfect in your diet or your, or your fitness plan that's important. It's being consistent, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's a fair answer, but um, I mean, again, right-sizing expectations and doing some of the right things is going to be better than better than the alternatives, right? And we do have good questions from Rachel, Patrick, and Nyla, but I, I know you have more content to share. Would you like to take those after a little bit? Um, let me, yeah, let me, let me jump through. Sure. I probably have three more slides here, I think, and then hopefully we'll have some time to delve into Great. any and all questions. Uh, and thanks again, everybody, for those questions. I love those. Um, so I changed my heading in midstream on this. Okay, let's 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 talk. We've, we've talked about scaffolding. We've talked about setting expectations, and we've talked about the rules and regulations of what it is to be on this board, and we're kind of set those out as aspirational objectives. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about getting down to the business of, of uh, getting this critical mass, uh, these two, three, four, five, ten 10 trustees, committee members uh, into the discipline, the practice of, of engaging um, and ultimately soliciting um, significant money. Okay, so I struck the word money from the header here with some intentionality. Um, one of the things that we're going to want to do is change how we're thinking about and talking about money because we all have complex feelings around that and when we start talking about money i think what flows from that are things like numerical goals right really 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 at the heart of it um stakeholders philanthropists um don't necessarily see the gifts that they're making in dollars and cents terms. They're motivated by a need or a drive or a desire to change the world, okay? To change some situation for the better. They're about impact. So I think it's important to consider and, and impart this, you know, as you're training and developing and coaching this core committee of force multipliers, if you will, these stakeholders who are gonna go out and, and help you raise money. We need to think in those terms too, what we're offering, and I didn't really understand this when I first heard it. Um, I had an incredible mentor and boss um, in my, my first, my first uh, two years uh, as an annual gift officer. And he said to me at some point, he said, Mark, we are brokers of people's philanthropic needs we're brokers of people's philanthropic needs i.e i didn't really get it i admit people have a need to be philanthropic people have a need to make a difference we're not extracting money from them we're creating an opportunity for them to fulfill 
that drive, that need that they have to make a positive difference in the world. So I think, and no, I, I, I'm certain that if, if you can keep the discussion around money uh, framed in those terms, um, you're going to have greater success. You're going to be able to create a better sense of comfort in that development committee. Because, you know, I think I heard over the years, any number of people would rather jump out of an airplane than ask somebody for money. It is not something we naturally are inclined towards doing. And your trustees aren't going to be naturally inclined towards doing it either, with rare exceptions. So we want to get them thinking a little bit about their relationship with money and how they're going to introduce and frame a conversation around money with their peers, okay? Um, so again, kind of going back to square one, uh, I think it's vital to have a campaign chairman, uh, a development committee chairman, um, a governing board chairman, someone who um, is a believer and this process as articulated here. Someone you can have some steady back and forth with, someone that you're spending a lot of time with um, and you're ultimately empowering that person or persons to really own this process, okay? Um, they are gonna become the chief voice, um, the chief driver of this kind of initiative. Um, practically speaking, build a calendar, have regular meetings. Um, the, you know, one of the, one of the credos we had at CCS fundraising was meetings drive results. Um, having that committee understand as part of their expectations that we're going to meet once a month, we're going to meet every two weeks, whatever it might be. We're going to have a check-in every Friday afternoon by phone. This is what you expect. This is what we're laying out for you. Build that expectation, live up to that expectation um, and make that a habit, okay? Make this part of your volunteers, you know, mental furniture, part of their game plan. Um, of course, you wanna have actionable goals. And I think again, alluding back to kind of previous observations, make right sizing those goals if you you know if you want somebody to make make 24 contacts in a month break it down into six a week okay break it down into three a week and maybe temper that top line goal accordingly um ask them would it be possible for you to make these three calls or these five calls okay then let's agree to do that and then of course you're keeping and some kind of dashboard that's showing everybody at the table, this is how we're doing. I mean, you want to use some peer pressure ultimately uh, to ensure that all the members of your team are important. So again, sometimes a smaller team uh, can be more responsive and more accountable than that larger team. Um, but again, when I talk about that leader owning the process, um, I think about a phenomenal campaign chairman I was able to work with a few years ago. Um, he and I would work on the agenda, which kind of became a set piece over time. Uh, he was the one who communicated that the meeting was going to happen day after tomorrow and the time and the place and the importance of you being there with me. Again, we're leveraging that person's peer relationship, that person's social capital to keep that board motivated and on task, okay? Again, that person just, the reality is that person probably just has more leverage than you do, okay? And that's fair. Um, position that person, leverage that person to help you do that lifting. And of course, on the other side, that person's doing important follow-up. And when that's when this volunteer kind of runs aground, you know, that leader is going to help pull them back in the right direction. So again, equipping your board leadership, equipping your volunteer team with really explicit how-tos. Hey guys, here's some best practices on setting an appointment. Here's what being in a in a in a in a, uh, a discovery visit or a solicitation call is going to look and feel and sound like. By the way, here's a script and here's roles that you're going to play and I'm going to play as the development director and as and what the CEO is going to play. Workshop that, 
rehearse that over time everyone's going to get it and it'll become more like second nature but on the front end at the in the beginning phases giving your team every possible crutch you can give them is going to be valuable okay um one of the great things you can do for a volunteer who is super nervous about going out to someone uh, under the auspices of being a board member at XYZ organization, what am I going to talk about? I think a lot of us, even, even when we're in the uh, major gift roles, relationship manager roles, um, we feel like we need to know in exquisite detail everything about that organization mission, its strategic plan, its finances, its enrollment, its impact, yada, yada, yada. Really, I think what's important is to uh, is to kind of flip um, the table a little bit and just ask people questions. How'd you get connected to this organization? How's this organization meeting your expectation? What surprised you in your, your relationship with this organization? What's disappointed you? Okay, people will tell you and you'll get an incredibly colorful and granular picture of who they are and what they value and how you might grade that person's affinity for the organization so you're asking questions is going to be so much more important than telling okay and it's also easier for that volunteer to do i think than coming in with a script an agenda a set of talking points okay and it's all perfectly healthy and productive so train your board up around those terms um that's kind of the nuts and bolts then i think that these critically critically important soft skills i would point to um again I've, i think i've probably um, um driven this point home um having a small number or even one person who is really really read in uh and really believes in the methodology uh is going to be is going to be uh critically important and it's going to pay huge dividends for you um, when I build a fundraising committee, trustees, non-trustees, um, I want them to get used to working with one another. Um, I want them to build a sense of their own voice around this project or cause. I want them to build trust in their own judgment and their own place at the table, as well as in one another. So I'm probably going to ask them to do some low impact, if you will, but again, critically important for the overall project task. Um, we need to build a case for support. I'm going to start drafting that as director of development. I'll work with my CEO on that as needed. And then I'm going to ask you to begin refining it, editing it. Okay, there's going to be some give and take. Um, and anytime you're obviously putting some work out for him you know asking for input from a volunteer you may get some things that you didn't really want and it may uh it may put you in the position of, of having to have some uncomfortable conversations okay but the dividend there is as that person works through say that case for support or the campaign gift acceptance policies they're getting themselves read into the process they're seeing themselves as um as an exponent of this particular project okay and so you're getting them working together around that um they're really wrestling with the big why for the campaign the big why for the organization that's really important for what they're going to be doing later and again you're getting them comfortable with the process they're getting you're getting them comfortable with you and with one another and then I think you can begin to move on to let's talk about how we feel about money. Let's talk about um, let's talk about what we're really going to go out the door and ask someone to consider. Okay, um, I think that's kind of the soft skill side of the equation here. So I'm going to kind of wind down here, and I'm going to just pan out, and I'm going to talk about some things that. Um, have been uh, vexatious, <laughs> problematic over a 25 year retrospective thing here. Um, one, um, the correlation between getting a visit with a prospect and having a positive outcome 
is remarkably high. I would say it's somewhere between 30 and 50%. So, you know, if you bat 300 in the major, in major league baseball, you're in the hall of fame. Okay. So if you're getting an appointment with someone, they've said yes to you at some level. And that's really, really significant. Come back from that visit with something. It could be they'll read a draft of your case for support. It could be they'll come to an event at your organization next month. It could be that they'll review a, a funding proposal, okay? But make sure you've given that person a sense of that time with those representatives of this organization was meaningful, okay? For a lot of the people that you're going to wanting to be work, working with, a lot of the people that you would deem to be your future stakeholders, your aspirational stakeholders, many of them are going to have more money than time in reality. The choices they make about what to do with their time is a really, really big deal. Don't fritter with it, right? Um, don't make it all social and happy talk. Make sure there's some business going on there. Even again, if it's kind of a low impact thing that that person can very easily do, again, read a, you know, read a draft of a case for support. Offer me your reaction. Um, make sure you make sure you're, you're, you you've got something that you can that you can bring home and say we got this much. Um, I've always been a little leery of lunch and dinner meetings. I've had dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of them, and I love food. I love lunch. I love dinner. Uh, I love meeting with new people. Um, these settings can be really cumbersome when we're getting down to the business of soliciting a gift. Okay, they're great for cultivation, but understand that when it's the time in that process where that person's giving you indications that they would entertain a proposal for funding or consider a board of trustee role with your organization. Try to make it a meeting in their home, try to make it a meeting in their office. I mean, that just creates an atmosphere that's just more businesslike. And besides, when you get into the lunch and dinner thing, they just, they just want to tend towards being social. OK, and you can find yourself, you know, paying the tab, shaking hands, saying goodbye and not coming back with anything. So be wary of those. Um, some big no no's. You've done all this incredibly important work. Your volunteers got that meeting set. You've had that meeting. And then your volunteer says, just let me send you some information. OK, or. Let me send you a pledge card if you're further on in that process. Um, no, um, no, just no. <laughs> um, and especially the pledge card thing. Don't ever, uh, I call that giving up the ball. Um, you need to maintain, your volunteer needs to maintain control of the dialogue. Um, um, and another version of that is, you know, hey, we've talked. Thanks again for your time. You just let me know when you're ready to take this conversation to the next level. Of course, the one in there about goals. Um, I don't think people will give money to help you reach your goal. Um, they're going to give money. They're going to be inspired and, um, inspired and excited. And you're going to get your optimal gift when they've bought into your theory of change, when they've bought into the vision that you've painted for them and you've helped them understand what an investment in your organization is going to do for the greater good. Okay. So again, it's not about the dollars. It's not about the numbers of dollars, okay? It's about the impact. Can't stress that enough. And some things that I love, some things that I love. Um, this is my overture, volunteer to prospect. Let me share with you why this cause, this project is so meaningful, so important to me. Um, one of the things I really didn't touch on enough is, is helping your committee, helping your board members articulate their personal case for support for the organization. If I could go back and do this over again, we would talk more about that. Um, I think that's crucial. I think it's more important than their ability to recite chapter and verse, uh, details about the organization. People are gonna be moved by the emotional leverage, um, the, the, the genuineness, um, 
the authenticity of someone saying, I wanted to share this with you because I'm just excited about it. Um, it's been a hugely wonderful part of my life to be connected to this organization. Whatever the details are, everybody at your at your board table and your committee has that story. They're there for a reason. Help them help them give voice to that. You know, that's a very personal, maybe one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. Um, asking to come and pick someone's brain, you you know, you're a knowledgeable person, whether it's building, whether it's finance, whether it's board leadership, um, you have a perspective. Could I, could I come and ask you some questions? That's a great way in the door. And this one, what I hear you saying is there's just not enough listening going on out there. So when a volunteer, a CEO, a development gift officer can say, yeah, Here's what I hear you saying. Um, you, you, hopefully, you're testing what you heard, and you're validating to that person that they're being listened to, and and we all need that, and we all want that, and we all appreciate that. Um, a great way, I think, to test the waters. I'm not a huge believer in the sort of stepwise. Um, um, what do we call that moves management system um that's you know that that we've all adopted back in the 90s uh, i guess um i don't i don't know that there's a wrong time but again based on what you're hearing um to say hey um you understand what we're about you understand the work we're doing you we really appreciate you giving us the opportunity to share that what would need to be true for you to come closer to this organization um, what would need to be true for you to consider a volunteer role or a gift? Okay, um, that's a um, it's it's not a, it's not blunt. Um, it's tactful. It's respectful, um, and it gives that person uh, some wiggle room in how they respond. And they also may tell you. And again, many many people at, at your aspirational prospect level find their time to be really really important. They may just tell you straight up, you know what? I don't think I'm ever going to be connected to your organization. I appreciate what you're doing. Or I'm really excited. I want to know more. Okay. So you can really qualify that person early on in the process uh, if you're equipped with, I think, some subtle and appropriate language to do that. Um, and then again, this one, holding the ball. Um, um, we've met. We've talked. I'm going to follow up with you in a set um, uh, window of time to hear your thoughts and your questions. Again, maintaining control of where that conversation is going, okay? So that's kind of what I have. I put in a couple of uh, things that just to put in your toolbox, um, these are just for example, um, what goes into a good board of trustees, a board of directors contract? It should be, it can be, really, really explicit. Um, here's a sample that goes into, oops, let me go back. Um, how many phone calls are you gonna make? Will you write notes uh, for stewardship purposes? Will you bring people to events? This is the kind of stuff you want them to be doing. Put that out there in writing, get them to respond, make that your norm. You're really gonna, you're really gonna change the directory of those board relationships. Uh, and again, I know everybody out there knows how to run a meeting. So this is completely gratuitous, but get that agenda out there, um, make it an actionable agenda, um, keep people focused, keep it on time, um, and follow up, hopefully, ideally, with the agreed upon actions, who's gonna do what, when, and how, okay? So that's what I got. Jay, um, do we have any time left? Uh, well, actually, we are open ended here, but I do know that many people do tend to leave at uh, at the one hour mark. So I do want to make sure that people know how they can get the rest of this content, uh, that slide deck. So first of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, that slide deck, of course, will be available to folks um, uh, uh, through an email that will be sent to you. So uh, we'll make sure that you get that in the next uh, day or two, and then you can simply click on that link and then you'll be able to access that slide deck. A recording uh, will be available over on the DonorSearch site at donorsearch.net. And you can see that simply by going to um, the uh, 
uh, donor search site at, at uh, donorsearch.net under the resources tab. And in fact, I've included in the chat a link for that. So if you take a look there, where people are now thanking you profusely. So thank you for that and, uh, and for the feedback. I'm, I'm so, I'm, I'm so, <laughs> you are all so welcome and thank you. Um, you can take a look there for that link and click that. Um, we did get a question from a couple people about sending a CFRE credit acknowledgement. We have not traditionally done that because, in fact, I don't think it's necessary. However, if you want to send me a note directly, I will get it to the people within the donor search marketing department. And if there's something that they can share with you, they certainly will. Um, this is CFRE accredited. So anything we can do to help you in collecting those credits for your CFRE, which Mark has, uh, we'd be happy to do. And you can reach me at j at donorsearch.net. That's my donor search email address. That's j a at donorsearch.net. Um, you can also get uh, copies of this recording and all the other recordings over there at the donor search site. Now we do have other questions here, and maybe I can just share one of them as we as we uh, round up things, uh, because uh, there are a number that are great. But this one may uh, be something that a lot of people have run into, um, and that is about um, people who need a dignified uh, off ramp. Now, so we've talked a lot about getting people on the board, and I know that it's going to be hard to make this concise, Mark, but maybe some thoughts about how to help people understand that they've been really valuable and there might be other ways for them to contribute um, if they were to leave the board and make space for some of the new energy that you've been talking about today. Yeah, um, I. it's possible that I'm guilty of kind of making light of what is what is a bit of a fraught proposition, right? You've you've had someone do the work of being a board member, whatever that yardstick looks like, whatever that commitment has been, and now you now you want to say, you know, hasta la vista. Um, so, and for sure, I, I can look back and I can think of people that had social capital. They were likable. They were positive, fun people to be around. But in all fairness, they just didn't square with those expectations. You, you know, you want to continue a relationship with them. You want to stay on good terms. And I think one of the things that that comes to mind, one of the things that's that's would not be original, is to have an emeritus board, right? Um, say, look, you, we want you to be you know feel free to be at our meetings you are um you are an esteemed person in our community we value you we love you we want you to be in the circle we we need to grow our board we need to develop new people we need to develop new outcomes um so again creating that middle ground you're not going to be a voting member of the board but you're going to have a lot of the perquisites of the board uh, that you've enjoyed over the years is kind of a kind of a an amenable middle ground, I suppose you could say. Um, and again, and I think how over time you're unrolling and altering and reframing those expectations, um, I think people are going to get it. And I and I think that some are going to even, in fact, welcome and appreciate that maybe for the first time, or maybe to a different degree, this organization is now spelling out for me um, what I'm here for, okay? And, and I think they will, in many instances, just say, I get it, I understand, I understand. Wasn't necessarily a difficult conversation. Um, you've made it real clear, maybe through some of these objective measures, that this organization needs more from its board members. You know, you've challenged me, you've given me opportunity to think about it, um, and I'm gonna go in a different direction. But again, there are always gonna be those people that just have, you know, they're in, your, in the organizational pantheon and they, you want them to remain there. So finding some kind of role for them, um, non-trustee related, certainly is a diplomatic and valuable course to take that that that's that's one way to think about it thank you for all of this mark and um uh if anybody wants more information about how to reach out to you uh how how can they contact you <laughs> uh mark p uh at donorsearch.net uh, you can also find me on on the linkedin <laughs> always a good so, place to be <laughs> um 
uh, again, I want to thank everybody. Uh, I have been so fortunate over the years to, uh, to have some great and influential people give me benefit of what they know. I've worked with some incredible volunteers, all of whom I love and I've made lifelong relationships with. Um, and it's, it's great to be able to share some of it. So I appreciate the kind words, everybody, and, uh, and for sticking with me through this hour plus. Well, and thank you for doing this at all, given uh, the, your fever last night. Um, but you've raised us to a fever pitch to do the right thing. So that's the, that's the main point. So thank you, Mark. Oh, and th- well thank played. You to, great Jay Frost. <laughs> thank you to everybody who, who hung out with us today. We really appreciate you as well. Uh, do stay healthy. Um, unlike Mark in the last 24 hours, he's better now. You stay healthy out there and do join us for future sessions. We have a whole bunch coming, although we do have a gap next week, except for the podcast. We do have uh, an episode we just dropped um, two days ago with Rachel Hutchison. If you don't know her, you'll really enjoy listening to to her conversation with me about her work at BlackBot over a period of many years building that program of corporate social philanthropy and, and citizenship. Um, a really interesting personal story. There will be another episode of the podcast coming out next week, and we may even surprise you with something live uh, if uh, if we choose to do that over close to the um, Amazon Web Services meeting. But if not, you'll definitely see us the week after uh, where we have a whole slate of programs coming up. And in fact, we have 12 more this month alone. So if you don't well, get your regular <laughs> communications about the series, I hope you'll sign up at Donor Search so you can get those. Otherwise, just look for us where you find all this kind of content. You can find me over on LinkedIn, just like Mark. Um, uh, so until next time, just take care of yourselves and we'll see you soon. Take your vitamins, Jay. Thanks so much. <laughs> Will do. <laughs>